Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here. I have uh, the honor of having Artemis. We were just talking about her name before the podcast. So Artemis here. Don't call her Artie unless you're really good friends with her. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, Here, I'm I'm so happy to have you here because we we just met uh, like a week ago, two weeks ago from Mark. Um, I did not know you were in uh, Cirque Soleil until he told me. Um, so, but that's now probably what we're going to talk about now, but what I like to do with my guests is let them kind of tell their story and and we'll kind of go from there and and see where the conversation takes us. Sure. Sounds great. Thank you for having me, Austin. I'm very excited to be here. And I was the, I was actually, I wasn't in Cirque, but I was the strength and conditioning coach for CA. Okay. Their show CA, which is how, yeah, we all connected which is, it was a really great experience, which I can share that as part of my story. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, my story as see how, you know, how I don't want to drag it out really long, but I was born and raised in Newton, Massachusetts and um, athletics and um, was a very important part of my life from a very young age. So when I was three and a half, I started to take ballet, classical ballet. And what drove me to do that was that my sister was, my older sister was taking ballet lessons and I wasn't old enough to take them, but because my sister was doing it, I wanted to do it because I wanted to do everything that my older sister did. So I persuaded my mom to persuade the dance instructor to get me to uh, to sign up for classes. And then from there, I dan- I took ballet from three and a half until I was 27. I went to the Boston Ballet for many years and was uh, like went to their summer camps. I really, I, I was good at it and I loved it. And it was something that I, there was a period of time that it was something that I thought I was going to do as my profession. Uh, but a lot of my experiences during that time shaped what I got into later on in life in terms of what I did for work. And that was that being, uh, taking, being in the ballet, being in ballet, like my body did never matched the classical ballet body image. And so I definitely sustained a lot of, um, a lot of negativity about my my body and created a very poor body image based upon it and suffered from an eating disorder when I was in high school as a result of it. Um, and that was something that like disordered eating was something that really plagued my life until I was 29 or so was when I really just kind of got fed up with food controlling my life and decided to start to tap into intuitive eating. And I was just so sick of thinking about everything that I ate and how it shaped my body every time I took a bite out of it. And so I I started to let go of that when I was 29, which is, which is great. Um, But I think like when you suffer from something like that, you are never quite over it. Like I still have, even though I am uh, past that, that was another lifetime there. I still have my, my days, right. Even at I'm 45. So even at age 45. And so from there, uh, so I took ballet and then, um, I went on to study, uh, when I decided to give up ballet, cause I was like really sick and tired of focusing on what I could do. I mean, uh, uh, focusing on like what I looked like. I wanted to focus on what I could do. I started studying Kung Fu and that was when I was 27. And then that led me, and I love that because that transition was like, at, when I started studying Kung Fu, I never, I never went back to dance ever again, ever. Like it was just like, it just was like a, a switch that flipped. And um, I loved Kung Fu because it, I was just focusing on what I could do on how strong I was on how uh, powerful my kick was, how fast my punch was, can I do knuckle push ups on a hardwood floor, like things like that. So um, with that, that was, that was a really big transition for me in terms of confidence and body image. 
and uh, focusing on what, what I could do versus what I looked like. And during that time, I I went through growing up in Newton, Massachusetts. I don't know if any, if anyone's listening, if you know Newton, Massachusetts, but it's actually there. It's a pretty uh, wealthy suburb suburb of Boston. And uh, my dad is a son of Greek immigrants. So he, when his, his, his parents, my grandparents came over to the United States from Greece and um, his dad died when he was very young, when he was three years old and he's the youngest of three children. And so he and his brother and sister had to help uh, because my, my grandmother didn't speak English very well, but they had to work hard to support my my grandmother, my yaya, and um, and so my my dad is a self made. Now he's a retired attorney, but he's a self made attorney. He went through this journey of of overcoming being the son of immigrants and and becoming a self made attorney and putting himself through law school and all that. And uh, my mother is from Linfield, Massachusetts, and so they instilled a really strong work ethic in me. So while we grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, surrounded by people who seem to have, you know, a lot have like had money in their, their families for generations. We were there because my parents worked really hard to make sure that we were somewhere where we could have a great school system and, and, um, and be able to follow that path of higher education. Higher education is very strongly valued in my family. My mother has her MBA. And uh, so that's the path that I followed. I went on, I went to to college, I went to GW, but I really didn't even know what I wanted to do when I went there. I ended up majoring in psychology, which I loved and I use a lot now, which I'm sure you use a lot of that too, Austin, in your coaching. And um, But from there, I didn't, when I first graduated from college, I didn't do anything with it. I went to go work in procurement for, I was living in in Washington, D.C. So I went to go work for the the Department of the Treasury, the United States Mint, and I worked in procurement for them. And I, I worked in procurement for eight years, not loving it. And I knew there was something more that I should be doing with my life. And so with that, with my athletic background, that's what led me to fitness and my brother, my younger brother, he graduated from the University of Colorado at Boulder in, with a degree in kinesiology, and he went on to be a personal trainer starting out. Now he's a doctor of physical therapy, but uh, he said, you know, hey, Artemis, like, I know that what you want to do is work as personal trainer. You want to work in fitness. And but at that time, I was just really struggling with the, you know, will I be able to make a living as a personal trainer, right? If, because if I don't work, I don't get paid and I'm going to leave this really secure office job and go and work as a personal trainer. I don't know. I just, I didn't see how I was really scared to make that, to take that leap and make that transition. So what I did do, and this was back in 2003, is I went and I got my spin instructor certification and I started teaching spin classes part-time in addition to my full-time office job. And then I started to love my part-time job so much more than my office job. And I, um, I, I, um, I, my office job became something that was just like paying my bills, right? I like started to just really dread going there and just get excited to leave to go and teach my classes or teach my classes in the morning. And then from there, I still, you know, stuck it out for about five years working in the office world. I ended up switching from working in, in procurement, you know, during contracts administration and negotiation to uh, consulting. So I started to do software implementations and business process analysis and, and consulting. And I thought that would solve all my problems. I was like, maybe it's just like, I don't like writing contracts and administering them and negotiating. Maybe I just need to, like, I really just want to be doing this. And then I did that for five years and was like, no, I hate this too. (laughs) I actually just really love my part-time job. And that's really what I want to do. So I finally got, you know, everything together and and left the office in 2008 to work full-time in the fitness industry. And then after that, like, I never looked back. I, I started working in a commercial gym and then I went on and I met my husband and we opened up a gym in, um, in Boston, Massachusetts. I, I moved back. I moved back from, I moved back to Boston from the DC area. And that's when I met my husband and that was in 2009. And then we opened up our gym in 2011, small studio training gym. We ran that for five years. 
we thought that was going to be our dream. And um, it was, we specialized in kettlebell training. And, um, and with that, I still kept going with my, my athletic endeavors. There's this challenge called the Iron Maiden Challenge in the kettlebell, hard style kettlebell community that I trained for three years for and completed. And um, what it is essentially is regardless of weight or size, um, for women, you go in and you do a 53 pound strict military press, a 53 pound uh, weighted pull up from a dead hang, and then you do a 53 pound pistol squat. And men use um, 106 pounds to do it. So I trained for I'm you know I'm like five one, like 115 pounds. My challenge was like man, like no one my size has ever done it before. I wonder if someone my size can do it. And it took me three and a half years or three years, not three and a half, it was like three years. And, and I completed it. So, you know, that was still keeping up with the, these competitive athletic endeavors were really important for me. Um, Cause just like, you know, Kung Fu, I went on to get my black belt. And then after that, it was like Iron Maiden challenge. And then, um, so my husband and I, we opened our gym and, we were really excited about it, but there were so many challenges with this facility. We got into uh, a space that was way too big for us. The The lease was like just way too high for us to get into starting out, but we were in a really hairy situation subleasing to run our business. And so we were having a conflict with the, the gym owner that we were subleasing from. So we didn't have, we had to move fast and we didn't have a lot of choices in terms of spaces at the time. So we just settled for like what we could, what we could get. And that sort of kicked off the, uh, the challenges of our business of owning a facility. Um, we ended up, we ended up in a contractual dis- dispute with the, uh, with the, the first landlord with that initial landlord. And we fought them because we had signed our, um, we had signed our house as a guarantee, a personal guarantee on the lease. So we fought them because we were, we were right. And they were, we, we believed we were right. And so we we were fighting them for that, but also to save our house for two reasons. And so we, we fought them for about 18 months. And during that time, our, lawyer was dealing with some other things for us and helping us. And, and then he advised us to leave that facility to, to go to another facility while we were fighting this fight. So we moved into our second facility while we were doing this. And in the end, um, there were some moments where it looked like we were going to win, but this company was a very, um, they're a very large realty company in the Boston area with a lot, a lot, a lot of money, a lot of property. And uh, the second to last judge was going to rule, looked like they were about to rule in our favor. And then the case got turned over to a different judge who had a relationship with this, this real estate company and ruled in favor of this real estate company. So to save our house, we had to file for bankruptcy. We had to file for personal and business bankruptcy. And that was really tough. That was like a really dark period. Sorry, I'm getting emotional about it. No, it you're, good. Really, you're good. You're it good. You're was good. a really <laughs> dark period because it was something that we didn't want to do that. There's a lot of stigma with bankruptcy, right? There's a lot of shame associated with it. So it was really hard to do that, but we we did it and we had to close the gym. And uh, then my husband, what brought us out to Vegas and working for Cirque was that at that time, as we were getting ready to file for bankruptcy, we had to like do something to pay the bills. Right. So my husband is an athletic trader and he went on to um, apply for jobs to get back into his field of athletic training. Cause when I met him, he was working as an athletic trainer at Boston university, the, a senior athletic trainer at Boston university. And he left Boston university and he left the field of athletic training to run the gym with me, right. To own and operate this gym together. So he was like, oh, I'm just going to get back into this. Like we need a break from everything. And, you know, the crazy thing is, is, is that like we had this gym for five years and as soon as we moved into the new facility, we revamped our business plan and all of our offers and, and how we ran, we got away from one-on-one and we started to do like group classes and small group training instead. And things were going really, really well in this new facility. The facility was perfect in terms of size and expenses. And then it was like a uh, store, for, it was like right on the street front storefront, like everyone could see it. And um, how our new business model was doing really, really well. But 
we were both just totally burnt out. We were just completely, even though that was going well, we were just like, we're so done with this business anyway. Like we don't even have it in us to, to like, to enjoy what is happening right now. Right. Cause we're still fighting this. We're still in litigation right now. Right. And um, so he ended up applying for jobs in his field. He applied for a job at Cirque du Soleil to be the head therapist for their show Zumanity out in Las Vegas. And it was funny when he did that too. Like I remember so clearly when he was applying for this job, I was where we lived in Roslindale, Massachusetts. And um, it was a, in a, in a walk up, we were in a, um, a two family home that was converted into four condos. There were two on the bottom floor and to upstairs. And, um, and we, I remember standing in the kitchen and he was sitting in our living area and he was like, what do you think about moving to Vegas? <laughs> I was like, sure. <laughs> and I had never even visited Las Vegas, but I was just like, compared to what is going on in our lives right now, I'll do anything, man. <laughs> you know? So, um, I was like, yeah, okay. He's like, okay, yeah, because there's this job at, with Search Delay in Las Vegas. I'm going to apply for it. I was like, great. So he applied for it and he got the job. And so when we closed our gym, my husband moved out to like, literally, it was like five days later, he was in the car driving cross country to go and start at Cirque. And then I was hanging back uh, for a couple of months, just packing up the house, waiting for the movers. And we still had some clients that I ended up training out of, um, out of a friend's facility for a couple of months before I left. And so he headed out in November, 2016. And then I moved out in January, 2017. And that was a, you know, that was definitely challenging. He was, Cirque put us up in the Candlewood Suites. So my husband, husband worked, he lived in the Candlewood Suites on the strip for two months. And then when I get out there, I was in the Candlewood Suites for two weeks. And when we got out here, you know, we had fresh bankruptcies on our records. And it was really hard for us. We had to get out of the Candlewood Suites. I mean, Cirque couldn't pay for our housing forever. There was a time where it was going to end. And then we also didn't want that to be the rent that we were paying. We wanted to get an apartment. So it was tough to find a place that would rent to us. But we did, thankfully, we found a place and uh, we lived in that apartment for a year. And during that year, 2017, like it wasn't over. When we filed for bankruptcy, it, it was not over. We still had to sell our house. And um, when we went to sell our house, we our condo in it was actually a condo, our condo in Rosendale. It it had it, we had bought it for two hundred thousand, and then um, it had gone up in value. In that people, we had a whole bidding war, which was amazing. And um, the highest bidder was about four hundred thousand dollars. So we we're super excited about that. And, um, but then when we were going to go through the closing, our bankruptcy attorney had screwed up and had forgotten to file the paperwork to remove the lien from our house. Cause we had gone through, like, there was a point in time where the, they had put a lien on our bank accounts and as well as our house. And when they put, how we found out about the lien on our bank accounts and I know I'm like, just really going to, I'm kind of like all over the place giving all these things, but um, I, we we were, I remember we were down at, at the beach for a weekend and we went to go to the grocery store and we swiped our card and it wouldn't, and I'm like, I know there's money in the bank account. And I went and I checked our bank balances and they had drained our business accounts and they had taken the maximum allowable out of our personal accounts. And we were like, oh my, I mean, I, I swear, I, re, I still to this day, like remember that feeling. It was just like, it's just feeling so unsafe and so violated, right? Just so unsafe. Anyway, so we, we like went, drove back and switched banks and all this stuff. And, uh, but it took, you know, it's taken years to like get over that whole experience with the gym. And um, so with that, when we were here selling our house, our bankruptcy attorney had screwed up and forgot to take the lien off our house. And we were, and so we could have actually, we could have brought legal action against him, but we were like, cause we had, there was him and there was like two other lawyers that we were working with. And they were like, you can bring legal action against him. Like he really screwed up. And we're like, we're done with litigation. 
Like <laughs> we've been doing that for like a year and a half. We're all set. We just want to get this fixed. So it took, um, that was like in May, 2017. And then finally we got like the paperwork filed and everything. And we were just like, we hope we can keep this buyer. We'll hang out. If not, we'll find another buyer, hopefully. And then we didn't end up closing on the house until like August, 2017. It was that long. So we had to like, at that point, the offer had expired, all those things, right? All at it. So we had to have, she was still like in it. She was like, I'm in it. So that was great. We still have the buyer, but we had to refile all like the paperwork and the closing and all that stuff. And I remember that was a very deep, dark time for me. Like 2017 was a year I was very, I felt hopeless. I felt depressed. I felt like I totally washed up. And then when that whole thing, and we like selling the house was like, we were like freedom. We're finally going to be done with all this stuff. And that was in May. And then when that didn't happen, I remember I just like fell into a hole and I was just like, luckily, I didn't have to work a lot. I would just, my job was to just get up every day, work out, lay out by the pool, read self-help books, watch movies at night. Like every single night, my husband would come home from work and I'd be like watching my movie of the night because that's what I was doing. Because like, I honestly was incapable of doing anything else. And so when that whole thing happened with the lean, I was just like that. I just went to a whole other low level. And then finally, when it all worked out and we closed our house and everything, um, we, we were, we, my husband, how Cirque is structured is that when you, um, uh, like the shows, they have dark periods for vacations. So you know what your schedule is for the entire year. So there's a big two week dark period that we would have to take our vacations every single year over because you don't get any time outside of that scheduled dark period that they dictate. So my husband's dark period that year was in August. And it was like about five days, we closed on the house on the sale of the house about five days before the dark period. And our plan was like, we were going to go to Hawaii. We're going to go to the big Island and we're just going to fucking like enjoy ourselves for the first time in like five years. And so when that happened, it was like, I'm like, we're buying the tickets we're like booking the house. And my husband, like, I literally had to like take his hand and like put his finger on the keyboard and be like, buy now. Cause he was like, cause for the first time in so long, we had money and he was like, you know, didn't want to let go of the money. I'm like, we got to go on vacation. We got to go. And honestly, we only spent like 5k on that entire vacation, which is like nothing. But at the time it just was like letting go of anything was like, it was terrifying. So, um, we ended up going on vacation. It was great. And that was, so since then, since we've been in Vegas and, um, and I, and I forgot to mention like when we moved out here, so my husband was working for Cirque and even though I was not in the best place in 2017, I did have some, uh, revenue streams in terms of, uh, like when we had our gym, we started an, um, an online business back in 2013 with one-on-one clients, a subscription group and like DIY programs. And so I had, I still had like part-time online business. And then also, as soon as I came out, I did apply, there were two strength, strength and conditioning positions open at CERC at that time. And so I did apply for those positions and I ended up get first getting hired on as an on-call. And then I got the, um, the assignment of being the dedicated strength and conditioning coach for Ka. So then that just was like the process of rebuilding from like 2017, 2018, 2018, I started to get my mojo back. And I was like working at Cirque. I was like increasing my online business. I had this, I had this women's strength workshop I used to teach called I'm not afraid to lift. I got back into teaching that and scheduling that all over the U S um, I started to train people out of our garage gym. So I was like totally getting back into the groove and feeling good. And, and then in like 2019, I decided like, Hey, I want to leave Cirque and I want to get let go of my in-person clients. And I want to grow my online business to a full-time business. So I did that. And that, that happened very, very quickly. Like as soon as I made the decision to do that, um, I, I hit my, I thought it was going to take all year, but it actually took like five weeks for me to hit my revenue goal so that I could leave Cirque and start to let go of my, my in-person business. And then at the end of 2019, uh, so my husband eventually left Cirque in August, 2019. And then at the end of 2019, I was like, okay, we both decided together that we wanted to pivot our business to business coaching and help other entrepreneurs start, grow and scale their online businesses. So that's what we do now we have. And and we also work on, 
you know, because we went through a lot in terms of money mindset and healing our relationship with money. And we had to overcome the shame of bankruptcy. And really like, you know, part of overcoming that shame of bankruptcy was about like, you, when, you know, I'm sure anytime you're making a mindset shift or you're overcoming any sort of experience that you have a lot of guilt and shame about, you have to, the way you heal from it is you disassociate yourself from it. And the only way that you disassociate yourself from it is if you start to just talk about it the way you take your coffee, right? You know, like, so I just started like talking when I was ready to start talking about it freely, publicly writing emails about it, posts about it and everything. Like now I can just talk about it. It's a, it's a lesson learned. And we learned so much from that in terms of, we just learned like I, our business is incredible now. Like what went down with our gym drove all of the amazing, great, excellent decisions that we have made with our online business. And as a result, we hired like the right mentors, we hired the right team, we've done everything, quote unquote, right with the business that we have now as a result of that horrible experience that we had with our gym. And, um, and that's just, so I don't regret it at all. If I hadn't had that experience, I, I wouldn't be the entrepreneur and strong human being I am today. And um, yeah, and I also wouldn't be out in Las Vegas either. I would still be in Boston shoveling snow. <laughs> so that's the other good thing. Like I always joke, like we literally manifested our, cause I, in this, in the winter of 2015 in Boston, we got seven feet of snow in a three week period. And I was that winter that my husband and I were like, as soon as we're done with the gym, we are moving somewhere where there's no snow, there's better weather, and there's a lower cost of living. And I truly believe that even though how we manifested our move to Vegas was not like we had to go through hell to, to manifest it, that's how we manifested it. Because that's what brought us out here. Because everything just lined up for my husband at, with that job at CERC, like everything. It was, it was pretty crazy how it all just like fell into place. So yeah, I know I've been like talking for like a half an hour. <laughs> All right, guys, but that's that, the pot. Guys, that's the podcast. We'll see you later. <laughs> Artemis just interviewed herself. So yep. uh, I'm gonna shut up now. I'm gonna let you take. It. <laughs> I'm I, drink you, the water. Thirty minutes on the dot, folks. Mm -hmm. She 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 challenged the record for Corey. Oh, that's the God. longest Austin's ever been quiet before ever. Um, you know what's interesting? Um, you could be a drug addict and you could be an alcoholic and people are more comfortable talking about that than they yeah. are bankrupt than they are bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. Totally. In America, I have coaching clients that had a bankruptcy at 22 and he's 46 and it's still fucking with him. Mm. Like, and he's, and he's a millionaire <laughs> and he's a millionaire. And the reason he was in bankruptcy is why he became a millionaire because he learned exactly. his lesson, Yep. but he didn't want to equate. He didn't see that. So when you said, you know, I had to start talking about it. I had to start dealing with it. It's the number one thing I tell everybody when it's in the closet and the lights are off, it controls the fuck out of you. Yeah. If you can own it, then you can get over it. Right. If you're, yeah. yeah, if you're not talking about it, you're still living that truth. You're mm. living your past as your truth. So until you start talking about it and disassociating yourself from it, you can't create your new truth and, and literally start living your new truth and your new life. You one have to. Things, one of the things I do with my coaching clients is I said the reason that you cannot change bad behaviors or bad patterns is because, just like you said, you're too associated with them. So I make them create a fake character they hate and a fake character they love. And anytime they do those patterns, I make them call them that self. And it's a trigger to say, Oh, I'm doing it again. And then what happens is over time, you just remove those bad patterns from you and you step into the true you. It, it works like clockwork because it's too wrapped up into your identity. You can't pull it apart. Mm -hmm. But what's yeah. interesting is I read your post just the other day and you said, even in 2019, with your coaching business that you, you, nobody explained it better. You were charred, you were charred and burnt out. Mm -hmm. And so, so many times in life, you've done the thing that you thought you were supposed to do, 
but yet you got to the end and you were still burnt out. And so what have you learned since then that has created the business that you currently have that's so successful the way that you wanted it to? Well, one of my patterns is that, um, and I, and I, we actually were talking about my pattern at this business retreat I was at last last week because um, uh, I'm trying to figure out, and I don't have a name for her yet, but I was last week I was talking about, I need to like come up with a name for her. But one of my patterns is that I just, I get stuck in the doing. I'm like doing, 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 right? I keep thinking like, I just need to, if something's not working out the way I want it to work, I think that I need to do more. And, um, or if the, or if I'm in the process of going through the process, whatever that process is, I think I need to force the process in different Mm. ways. Mm -hmm. And so what I have been, have worked on, which I'm in a much better place now, because now that pattern, like she can sit next to me, I can pour her a drink, we can hang out, like I'm cool. Like I don't get like when I first identified that pattern, I literally it was like waterworks, like, you know, just I was like bawling for hours about it. But um it, it was um I lost my train of thought. But like so now I've let go of like doing so much and I just I recognize I catch myself if I start to get into that and then I'm like, Oh, no, I'm like doing it again. I've done enough. And I can just sit here and recognize that I'm in the process of being in the process, whether it's, you know, and it's the same thing. The analogy that I was giving when I was talking about this last week was also like, I I even do it like when I fight with my husband, like, like, we're having a fight. And then I'll just like keep pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and like forcing when it's like, no, we're in the process of having the fight. So just like, let it be and then if you just let it be then the discussions will come organically it'll just Mm -hmm. happen it'll work itself out you guys will be able to talk but if I'm like pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and forcing him to talk when he's not ready then like it doesn't work right it's just like banging my head against the wall so that was like one of the biggest things and um and, and before that it was like when I hit, like when I was, you know, my chart burnt out ass at the end of 2019, it was like, I need to hire a coach. Cause one of the, the mistakes that we made with our gym is we didn't hire a mentor early enough. We didn't hire a mentor until like we were halfway through and we were like in the thick of it. And Mm -hmm. that was like when we changed our business model and everything, when when we got to the new facility. And, um, so this, my lesson learned was like, I just need to always make sure I have a mentor guiding me and being my objective perspective. And, uh, and the reason why I chose the mentor I did at the end of 2019 was that I know that she was going to help me with the business strategy, but that she was also going to help me with the shadow work and the limiting beliefs and the patterns and all of that, because, that is, that's what was driving the the repeated burnout over and over again. So I got that, you know, the, the right tactical strategy to set my business up the way I needed to in terms of offers and how to do marketing and all that stuff and launches. And, but then I also got this, I also had a coach who was able to say, Artemis, like you're doing again, let's like, let's work through this, right? So you can start to disassociate yourself from that pattern. You're not doing it as often. And, and then mentor, eventually like never, right? Yeah. My mentor uh, posted a video the other day. He said, if you're a true leader of business or a true leader of people, you need to become the door, not the doer. So you open the door for the others around you, the ones that work for you and you show them the way and then you get the fuck out of the way mm-hmm. instead of the doer, you know, and, and, and I think doing gets you where you need to go. It gets you started. But once you get to that point, you need to stand back and look up enough. And that's why I've spent this whole year on making sure that, you know, the the social media, the marketing is exactly who I'm trying to target. And the first year was just about getting over the fear of doing it in the first place. And now it's like, okay, now where are we really going? So on and so on. And, you know, you spoke about having to overcome uh, what most people have a problem with, which is money. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that seems to me, 
mean, it is one of the biggest things that nobody talks about slash nobody is comfortable talking about slash mm -hmm. uh, just kind of hides around. And, you know, nobody's allowed to say they want money anymore. Right. You know, we have to be humble and we have to, like, but you could make more money the right way and you could give more of it back. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, there's such this, I don't know, it's just such a toxic environment with money these days. Yeah. It's very, you know, I, it's like it money falls in the category of like, no one's really talking about like sex, drugs, poop or money. Right. <laughs> but it's how that's, and it's still a process. Like I'm still working on stuff related to it, but part of that process was, talking about it freely in my business with my clients being completely transparent and then just even talking about it freely on social media, talking about what I want, what are, what are my money goals? What are my abundance goals? And just talking about it without being afraid of people judging me and then knowing full well that if people judge me, then that means they, that's their issue and that they have a lot of work to do when it comes to money mindset. And so I have no problems talking about money, but if I end up triggering someone as a result, well, they need some help with that. Right. And it goes back to our relationship with money goes as far back as when we were like seven or eight. And that's when we formed our beliefs around money based upon how our parents talked about it, the experiences we had at that time. And then we start to shape our lives around those beliefs in as we get older and we create this whole life around it in terms of we learned like you have to work hard to make money then we think that you always have to work hard to make money like let's let's get real real here right like and, and i think jen sincero talked about this in her book you're a badass at making money she said do you ever see rich people working hard no <laughs> no that's a really good point yeah all right. They figure out like they're rich because they learn how to make their money work for them. Right. They, they get paid, like say like their income is their quote unquote seed money, but they learn how to plant those seeds. So it works for them and it grows into a big ass garden and they can just not work a lot. Right. And or like, so that's like one of them or that um, only, or that rich people are greedy, selfish assholes, which is bullshit. I mean, look at Tyler Perry. He's a freaking billionaire. And he is like the most giving, loving, philanthropic person out there. He's one of the most, right? And um, so, and all those types of beliefs that maybe you learned from your parents or your relatives, your family members, and um, just any experiences. And then you start to carry those into your life throughout your entire life, unless you work on them, and then you create your entire life around it. So if you have judgments about money in that, like you think you have to work hard to make money, or that there's never going to be enough money, or that money runs out, or that um, wanting money makes you materialistic, or that rich people are greedy, you know, greedy assholes, like then, then that's what you are going to manifest in your life. You're going to manifest money running out. You are always going to attract or just see rich people as, as greedy um, or because, or because you have that judgment of rich people, you will never, uh, you assume that if you become rich, then you will become materialistic and greedy. So you will, so therefore, since you hold on to that belief, you will never allow yourself to become rich. So Kyle C said on Lewis Howes, uh, the number one way to get rich is, or the, to get rich is solely based on your ability to be okay with being poor. Meaning we don't need it. So it doesn't own me. Yeah. It doesn't like control me. And I'm, and I'm just going to live in my truths and live who mm -hmm. I am and let it just attract to me and stuff like that. Um, well, guys, that was Artemis interviewing herself on the podcast. She's very <laughs> talented, super great at it. Uh, always love our conversations. Thank you for sharing your story. And I love how I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've met a lot of people in my life. I want to say you're the only one that's shared 
a story like that, or, or at least the, the whole story of that. And it's super powerful Thank you. for anybody that's out there. The reason I started the podcast, the reason I do my events is I, I tell this tagline and it's, I mean it. Everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. You have to share it. And when you share your story, you realize that you're not the only one with that story. And because if you're not the only one in that story, then together we can heal, together we can fix, together we can change the world. And so that's why these podcasts are important, live events are important, so people get up and share. And if you affected one person with what went down today, then we did our job. And so Mm -hmm. um, if people want to follow your journey, they want to find out more about what you and your husband have going on, how would they do that? The best way is to find me on Instagram which is my full name, which is really long, Artemis underscore Scantilides, but I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. So that, um, and then also, I guess you could, you know, go to our website, which is the name of our business is Empower You Online Coaching, which we created this name of Empower You, Empower with a capital U, because it's all about empowering yourself, empowering yourself to create your own destiny and, create your dream business. And as a result of creating your dream business, creating your dream life, because money is freedom. The more money you have, the more free you are just going back to rich people don't work hard. (laughs) So if you say you don't want money, just think about the things that you do want. And I guarantee you, they will be connected to having money. Those things will help you to money will help you to have those things. And money, it doesn't turn you into something you're not. It just amplifies who you are. So if you are a good person, then you will continue to be a good person and you'll be able to do great things with that money. You'll want to do great things with that money. Amen. Guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friend, share it with somebody that you think will get some value from this and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.